right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so Dr. Hamburg already did a wonderful job going over the basic biology of PCSK9 inhibitors, so I'm not going to uh, belabor the point. Um, currently, we have two drugs that are approved, alirocumab and ivalocumab. Uh, they both are monoclonal antibodies that bind to the enzyme proprotein converted subtilisin hexin 9 It rolls right off your tongue, doesn't it? Um, they're administered subcutaneously. She alluded to uh, silencing RNA. There's a drug called Enclisiran that's in phase two studies right now, but it's not ready for you know, clinical use yet. Uh, Dr. Hamburg already went over that, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, the two drugs currently, there's slight difference in the FDA approved indications. They're both approved for reduction of cardiovascular events in people with established disease and as an adjunct in people with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Ivalocumab has the additional approval for use in homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia as an adjunct to you know, medicines, LDL aphiresis, things like that. So with that, let's just dive right into the outcome studies. There are two large randomized control trials in this space. The first one out of the gate was Fourier, which tested ivalocumab. Um, I want to pay a close attention to the inclusion criteria for these trials because that kind of plays into who are the patients that should be best targeted with these drugs. So Fourier included patients between ages 40 to 85 with clinically evident atherosclerotic disease, previous myocardial infarction, stroke, symptomatic PAD, and other high-risk clinical factors which is basically diabetes, recurrent ACS, polyvascular disease, um, previous history of difficult to control, lipids, things like that. And they had to have a fasting LDL greater than 70 or a non-HDL greater than 100 on a background of moderate to high intensity statin therapy. This is the study design, just to point a couple of major features. Very large, 27,000 high-risk patients were enrolled in this study. Uh, they were randomized to ivalocumab versus placebo. Every 12 weeks, we would have followed up for a mean follow-up of 2.2, which is generally on the lower end of the scale for most LDL lowering trials, which typically run to five years of follow-up. Uh, the major endpoints are the time to the first occurrence of a large composite endpoint, which used cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, hospitalization for unstable angina, coronary vascularization, and a key secondary endpoint that used just the hard endpoints. The mean age of the patient population was about 60. Uh, more than two thirds were male. Um, most of the recruitment happened in Europe, so it's a large Caucasian population. They're otherwise pretty well matched in terms of their uh, baseline characteristics. As you can see here, they started with a median LDL of 92. Ivalocumab, consistent with prior studies, had a marked and consistent effect in terms of LDL lowering. So there was a mean reduction of 59%, uh, and that was consistent throughout the you know, duration of the trial. From a clinical endpoint perspective, there was a reduction in the absolute event rate of 2%, which was translated to a 15% relative risk reduction in the primary endpoint, which as you may recall, included myocardial infarction, stroke, death, unstable angina, and revascularization. And similarly, there was a 2% absolute risk reduction for the secondary endpoint of death and my stroke, which translated to about a 20% reduction in the relative risk. If you break this down into the secondary and individual endpoints, I would like to highlight here that there was no difference in cardiovascular death or death from any cause. Most of the endpoint reduction was driven by a reduction in non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, and the need for coronary revascularization. Here is a forest plot of all the subgroup analysis the authors performed. Uh, there was no significant interaction by subgroup. The effects were fairly consistent across the board. And if you look at the adverse events, um, the adverse event rates were fairly evenly matched between the ivalocumab group and the placebo group. I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. The significant difference is injection site reactions. They were higher in the ivalocumab group. Um, when it comes to very marked LDL lowering, we all worry about diabetes and neurocognitive defects. In this trial, 
with the caveat that it was short duration follow up. There was no significant difference in the adjudicated onset of new onset diabetes, and there was no difference in neurocognitive event rates. So to summarize the Fourier trial results, marked consistent LDL lowering, the median LDL achieved was 30. Decrease in CV outcomes on patients already on statins, 15% of primary endpoint, 20% of the secondary endpoint. And at least in this study, uh, safe, well-tolerated rates of discontinuation were low. And one of the keys, no neutralizing antibodies developed to the MAB molecule. The second trial in the space is the RSC outcomes trial, which e evaluated alirachumab. Again, to pay close attention to the inclusion criteria, people aged 40 years or older. This trial, compared to Fourier, enrolled ACS patients. Fourier was about stable atherosclerotic CBD patients. Hospitalized within one to 12 months, prior randomization with an acute coronary syndrome. Similar fasting LDL, HDL inclusion criteria with the addition of apolipoprotein. This, these investigators used this also as a way. And all patients had to receive maximally tolerated statin therapy. To highlight a couple of points in this busy slide, 18,000 patients were randomized uh, to eluracumab versus placebo, subcutaneous injections, mean follow-up of 2.8 years, again, short duration. And the primary endpoint was time to first occurrence of CHD death, fatal MI, ischemic stroke, constable angina, similar to the Fourier endpoint, except that they didn't include coronary revascularization in it. Baseline characteristics, again, are evenly matched, 58 years, mean age, largely Caucasian population, Aliracumab reduced LDL event rates. Now, in this study, they noted a slow drift back up of the LDL levels. The bottom dashed line shows the on-treatment um, LDL levels. The top solid line shows the intention to treat LDL levels. There was a small wrinkle in the way they designed the trial in the sense that they also had a lower bound of LDL. They said anybody who had a sustained level of LDL less than 15 they were going to back off on the therapy and left it drift back up. So these reflect the difference between LDL levels in people whom they backed off versus just intention to treat analysis where even those who got placebo were included. The primary endpoint, there was a 15% relative risk reduction with alirachumab of their combined endpoint of death MI stroke unstable angina. The authors in this study did a blistering array of secondary endpoints to point out some key ones, any coronary artery disease event. The, any cardiovascular event endpoint is somewhat similar to what the Fourier endpoint is, and again shows a statistically significant 13% relative risk reduction. They did a hierarchical modeling, so once they got a negative p-value for death from coronary artery disease, they just stopped testing further endpoints. So again, no difference in coronary death. The results were largely significant in both trials. If you look at this uh, subgroup analysis, the absolute benefit of these drugs is higher, the higher your LDL is, which makes sense. The adverse event rate, again, was fairly evenly matched. There was some increase, as with the other trial, in, the in, in local injection site reactions. Uh, not much difference in neurocognitive and no difference in diabetes. So again, two things that we are always worried about. And no difference in laboratory advanced events. I want to draw your attention to neutralizing antibodies. Uh, there was a 0.5% rate of neutralizing antibodies that developed in this study population. Just to, to summarize the Odyssey outcomes trial results, um, I put in a range here because it's based on the published literature, it's still not entirely clear if there's a true tachyphylaxis with the drug what is the significance of the neutralizing antibodies and what is the impact of the trial design. So we can expect somewhere in this range of LDL reduction. CV outcomes were reduced, 15% reduction in primary endpoint, 14% in all-cause death and my stroke. And again, drugs were safe, safe, well-tolerated, except for the injection site reactions. Uh, rates of discontinuation were low. And as noted, there's a point in 0.5% in of the patients that are neutralizing antibodies. And to date, we don't have much guidance on what the significance of that is. So a couple of key themes emerged from both these trials. Overall, PCSK9 inhibition for LDL reduction purposes 
is highly efficacious. It's generally safe, well tolerated. Um, on a background of moderate to high intensity statin therapy, which is key, there are significant reductions in non-fatal CV events, but there's not been a mortality reduction demonstrated to date. To date, there is no discernible lower bound for LDLC in terms of CV event reduction, purely from that step perspective. However, I want to draw some caveats too. So who's the right patient for this sort of a drug? Um, I focused a lot on the inclusion criteria because I want to make the point that these are very highly selective populations. They were very enriched for high, very high risk of future CVD events. So that's the sort of patient who would most likely gain some benefit. What is the right context? Um, they had to have an elevated LDLC based on maximally tolerated statin therapy. Uh, one of the interesting things about PCSK9 biology is that PCSK9 is upregulated in the presence of statins. So it's possible that you get more benefit when you are on the background therapy and it's unclear if it's not upregulated, what, whether it would have the same magnitude of benefit. And what's the right cost threshold, Dr. Cedo went over this uh, in some detail. And uh, the value proposition needs further clarification as the prices change over time. Thank you.